Hi, and welcome to Archery Ops Podcast, brought to you by Gold Tip Arrows and Bee Stinger Stabilizers. On each episode, we talk to top experts in archery and bow hunting about what it takes to shoot better and hunt better, target after target, hunt after hunt, shot after shot. I'm your host, Tim Gillingham. Let's roll. Hi, everybody. Archery Ops is launching our first episode here, and it's good to have somebody that's kind of veteran to the uh podcast world and kind of an expert on the topic we're going to cover today. Uh, that's Aaron Snyder. Many of you, if you listen to podcasts, have listened to Aaron and probably me bash it out. Um, we're doing a little bit different format here. We're doing a a more structured format, you know, kind of on a specific topic and prevent some of the, you know, the rambling. With that being said, uh, welcome, Aaron. Uh, thanks for thanks for having me on. It's always, uh, it's always a pleasure. I, I have to say, I think uh, one of uh, you are the second most downloaded podcast. One of the podcasts we did on on mine. So people enjoy listening to us ramble. I guess. <laughs> I think they like to hear us argue, from what I hear. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> something about yeah. something about four foot levels and you know whatever that comes up <laughs> frequently. Actually, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Well, you know, I always said I fight to the death on the things that I absolutely know. So. Um, that means that let's get right on topic here. Aaron's kind of the guy I go to, uh, you know, when I have, you know, outdoor gear things. I mean, he lives on the mountain. I remember one, one time he told me he lived on the mountain somewhere in upwards of 150 days a year. And I just thought that was psychotic. So is that true, Aaron? You spend that much time in the mountains? Yeah, more than that. Previous years now that I have multiple companies and things like that, it's, I mean, it's still 150 at least. Um, like right now, in about 30, 45 minutes after we get off the horn, I'm I'm backpacking in eight miles to go to go awesome. fishing. So people think I have a hard time staying married. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been married four times. Uh, okay. On that note, so if you want marital advice, don't don't ask me. I can tell you what not to do. Yeah, and this is great, you know, because I believe, you know, if you want expert advice, you need to go to the experts. Depending on what topic it is, you know, we can't all know everything right and i was just talking to aaron yesterday about you know some backpacking gear and i got a big elk hunt coming up and i don't get too serious on this stuff i mean but you know i don't want to pack any more than i have to i want good quality gear i don't want gear to fail me um you know living in the west here where i hunt you know you can get away from you know get back to camp pretty quick or back to town you know, you go to Alaska or somewhere like that. Now you're on your own and you got to really be prepared. That's one thing. You know, I lived in Alaska for eight years, uh, hunted Alaska. And, and when they drop you off in a float plane, you're there. You better have your your, your crap together. So Aaron also owns Kafaru uh, or you, you started working at Kafaru, uh, which is a top of the line backpack and outdoor gear company. He also started Born Primitive, which uh, is just some phenomenal outdoor gear and you know, it's always good to have the gear designed by the guy that's actually using it and to see a guy that's passionate about what he does, but he takes his job seriously, too. And, you know, give us some thoughts on, you know, you know, your kind of metamorphosis into where you're at now. I mean, because you work for a living at one time, too. Yeah, yeah, I work construction um, on commercial high rises, uh, glass and aluminum, steel, things like that. And um, you know, I did that, and then I would, uh, you know, like four, five, you know, Friday at three thirty, we would drive and hike in all night in the dark, and then spend a great two days in the woods, hike out in the dark on Sunday. And you know, doing that, I just, you know, like any like tournaments or anything else, you learn more and more and more about gear and you know, when you're on a poverty level, like there's different levels of gear, right? The poverty level is just be tough because you can't afford anything good. And then as you gain money, right, or monetary status, then you kind of get into a gear junkie phase where you're buying all kinds of crap you don't really need. And then you get to a point where I'm kind of at now where I'm really comfortable with the gear I have. I don't have a gear list. I know what goes in the pack. I don't weigh a lot of things all the time. Um, I go with the most durable, you know, what I know is going to get me through the hunt as light as I can. And then I test a bunch of stuff. And so, you know, so somebody's always, you got to pay the tollman, right? When you're backpack hunting. So that, 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 that tollman could be on the hike in. And that, that would be, if you go really heavy to be comfortable when you get there, 
you're paying the tollman in pain to get there. You go right. really lightweight, you're not paying the tollman on the way in, you're paying them yeah. when you get there by what yeah. you left back. And there's a happy medium with all that and that can change whether, like today, last night, I was pulling gear out like crazy because we have a 2,800 foot climb in the first three miles and then another five after that of unknown. We've never been there. We know a storm's coming in. So I had to go as Spartan as I could so I didn't die on the hike in, but also knowing we're probably going to get snow. We got a few river crossings. So, okay, well, what do I want to give up? Well, food's one of them. I gave up some food because uh, it's just the night. We're probably going to catch some fish. I threw some seasoning, some olive oil in there. So I'm hoping we catch fish because I didn't care. You know, I didn't pack up much food. You can go two weeks without eating and not die. So I'm not going to die for two days. <laughs> But I want a thick sleeping pad, you know, things like that. I want some rain gear. I need a good puffy jacket. And so that that Tolman for me could be paid once I get there because I dropped a lot of things out of the pack comfort wise to, to save the load in. So. I get this question a lot. How important are my stabilizers? Well, stabilizer is probably one of the most important things on my bow. Its job is to control the motion before, during, and after the shot. That helps us hold steady. It helps hold the bow still while the bow is loading and unloading from full draw to static. And it also controls the bow against our mistakes, so it makes it more forgiving. With Beastinger, you get a lightweight, high modulus bar with vibration dampening built into the bar. This is very critical in terms of getting the most out of your stabilization system. If you want to learn more, check out bstinger.com. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I've got some pictures of me in Alaska when I was young and dumb and on the broke budget. <laughs> and I'm sitting, I got a picture of me like this. I, I thought it was tough back then, you know, and I had a guy fly me into the this upper basin in the Chugach Mountains by myself. I thought I liked to bow hunt by myself, and I realized on that trip I really didn't. But I got this little $20 <laughs> up tent I bought from Walmart, wool clothes, you know. And, you know, I, I thought I had to, you know, fight some pretty bad weather. That could have been ugly. But, uh, and I remember another thing, another situation where a guy I, I went hunting with up here on the Wasatch Front, and I mean, we're going in for what, two days, two and a half days. And we, we take the tram up at Snowbird and we get to the top and I got my stuff and I just started jetting to the top because we were going to camp there and then drop in in the morning. And I look back down and he's clear at the bottom. I'm like, what in the hell's going on? So I dropped my stuff, hike all the way back down to him. I said, give me your pack. And I threw his pack on and about died. I swear to God, this guy had 75 pounds for three days. Like he, was afraid of, he was afraid of his shadow. And that that happens. You know, when I go over gear lists with, with people, um, you know, generally I can cut 15 pounds out of their gear list up to 20 on their first trip because the unknown, they're scared. They, they don't know what to bring and what not to bring and experience brings that on board. And so when you look at a gear list uh, for, you know, for anybody tuning in, like, you have some primary things you need. You know, you need to be able to build a fire. You have to have, you know, it's good to have some kind of an in-reach or Zolio. So, hey, tell your wife oh. you're okay. And if you break the leg, hit a button. Um, you, headlamp, basic things, the way to, you know, lightweight stove, cook set. Um, but the thing that kills people is the, I called it an article I wrote called the good idea fairy. You get all these good ideas in your head that seem great in the living room or in your basement. And then they're just not that good of an idea. But without experience, you don't know what's good and what's bad. And so like my clothing list, for an example, on a 14-day hunt, I have one set of underwear, and that's what I'm wearing. I have one extra set of socks, the pants I wear in, a fleece just like this, a puffy jacket, rain gear, a beanie hat, and gloves. It's anticlimactic for people because they're expecting this giant list. They'll bring a set of pants every two years, whatever. They bring a lot of gear. And then food, my food's dialed in. I'm at 120 calories per ounce. I'm at 32 to 3,500 calories per day, and I'm still in a caloric deficit, but that'll keep me going. But what also comes into play with that is your physical, um, knowing your physical ability, your heart rate, your caloric output to intake. So I don't, I'm not, you know, I do not go faster than what I know that I can keep up, so I'm not running on borrowed time. That has to do with the food intake I have and the exertion I'm putting out. Knowing I will be as fresh on day 12 
as I was on day one, two, and three. Right. And so I don't, I, I have a, I keep my heart rate monitor. I watch, I know where I'm at all the time. And then on the, the other stuff with overpacking on gear, you know, I don't, I carry a Nalgene in. I don't carry, you know, three liters of water. I don't carry eight pounds of water. Yeah. That, that was going to be one of my questions for you. Do yeah. you, when you, you, you're only, uh, like water storage is going to be your Nalgene bottle. You don't I carry keep a like bladder. A... Oh, okay. I keep an empty bladder in my pack for camp water or long days where I know I'm going to be away from, right. uh, that. You, so go ahead. Do you use a, like one of them suck on bladders or I, I got a helicopter ride because of one of them one time and I swore I'd never use one again. I don't. I've actually gone to um, either a titanium um, bottle because they're a little bit more durable or just a Nalgene, you know, standard okay. Nalgene. And, and I, I have quit using pumps, uh, filters. I use an MSR Aqua Tab for the most part. It's yeah, we a had tiny the little tablet. yesterday, yeah. It's the lightest lightest option I have. Now you may be drink, drinking Squidward's, right? It's not getting debris out of the water. You're yeah. paying a tollman, right? So if we all go and you see me drop down and I'm picking Squidward's out of the water, or I just drink them. Um, there's a, there's a comfort level for most people where they're like, there's no way I'm drinking that. For me, I've, I know what I can get away with as far as drinking water, but I don't bring a pump because that saves me a pound. Right. That also adds over 1600 calories to my pack weight, robbing one to pay the other. So you can bring Steripins. There's all kinds of different things, but yeah, I have one of those and I, yeah, I got one of those and I, I, I uh, just to interrupt. I actually called Aaron up when I was headed up on a hunt and I was like, Hey, what do you use to, you know, what do you think of these Steripins? I'm at the store. I don't know. I mean, a lot of it's marketing. A lot, I think there's a big thing, you know, this, this water purification thing. A lot of people are so paranoid of getting, some pathogen from the water that they'll pack you know i got a big msr filter that i take to alaska you know you know if you're flying in on a float plane or something and you you're pulling it right out of the river um i would would you tend to go to a bigger a pump style you know water filter system or is this primarily what you're talking about just for your backpack stuff yeah, so like at a base camp, I'll carry a pump or whatever, but backpacking, any type of backpack hunt now, I just use tablets. That is all I bring. <laughs> now, I'll use a Steripen every now and then. Um, it's quicker, right? 90 seconds, 30 ounces of water. Uh, but the one thing that I do, um, I carry a bino harness, a chest rig. I carry a one gallon, or excuse me, a, a quart a Ziploc bag in there, basically one liter. Um, that's my survival water uh container so if i'm on a stock and i'm getting beat down and i get pinned down or i i take an animal down my pack is you know a mile away from me i'll stop fill up that that ziploc bag drop my my tablet in there wait to 30 minutes and i'll just drink out of that because i can keep it in my chest harness i don't have extra weight from an algae bottle things like that just like little hacks sure um you know, and that's something you can carry all the time. The other thing that that's really good for you talk about water and I don't want to beat this horse to death, but just having a water source um, when you don't have a creek or anything like that. A lot of times I'll take a, a garbage bag like a contractor bag and I'll find a seat and I'll just set that up and let that fill up every day, all day. And then I come over and get water out of that because when you're in the high country, water is not in abundance in a lot of places. So rather if I don't have a creek, I take a walking stick ice axe with me everywhere. I'll dig out a seat, get it flowing. I may take like parts of, um, you know, your, your, your freeze dried meal wrapper and I'll make that into a funnel or a faucet basically to drip. And then I'll put my garbage bag under that and just leave it. And then I get my water out of that. So there's all kinds of little hacks, but when you're paranoid or you're not comfortable with those different things, or you don't know, you end up carrying more stuff. I'm not into carrying more stuff. See, I went on a hunt with Aaron one time for seven days up in Colorado, and I said, Aaron, do you, you think it'd be a good idea to have a, a horse outfitter's number if we kill something way back here? He's like, no, nah, I'll pack it out. So I would just take Aaron Snyder with you. Uh, yeah, my knees are catching up with me. I'll touch back on that, uh, some of the dumber, with getting an animal out for, you know, success or whatever. Um, when you, physical ability, if you, if you, when you go online, like to find information from people, like I have a podcast, Kafaru cast, 
Um, Rock Slide is a website I started. There's articles on there. That's the good idea fairy. Don't chase the rabbit or some of the big ones. Don't chase the rabbits about don't chase the lightweight rabbit. Go too lightweight. Um, and you know, my social media, I've got a Snyder's gear corner for like gear hack tips, things like that. But you know, when you plan for success and you're right, a lot of people, you know, they don't really know what to do because they've hunted three or four times for elk and then they finally get one. You know, you're looking on average, um, you are going to get a deboned meat 30% of what the elk weighs on the hoof. A little bit more sometimes, but if it's a thousand pound animals, you're packing out 300 deboned. Um, so 300 pounds is a, is a lot of weight depending upon your physical status. Um, generally um i'm good for about 150 depending upon the terrain i can i can do it in two trips i've done smaller elk in one trip and it, it has taken a toll um on me and at one time nobody believed that i know a few different individuals that can do it um and the thing that you really want to look at is is long-term um I've screwed up my body uh, badly. And when I say that, I've had stress fractures in my right foot. My knees are starting to bug me a little bit more now. Uh, probably not the smartest thing long term, but you have options. So if we're seven miles in and we kill an elk, do horses. we make, well, horses is a good one, but do you, <laughs> um, uh, do, do Tim and I make one trip and not hike back? Or do we make a few trips, but then add miles coming back and forth? I'm lazy and I don't want to make another trip, but I'm physically able to do that. Now you can piggyback the meat, whatever else, but the big thing too is also taking care of the meat. You know, if you're going to be piggybacking, which requires some set of skills or field craft, if you've got animals around marmots, you know, hanging it in a tree might not be the best option if you have bears. So you got to hang it off a cliff. If you hang it off a cliff, you have to have a decent knowledge of knot tying, especially if you're solo. So I've basically rigged up belays where I've belayed the meat down, tied it off because I was by myself because marmots will eat the meat. You know, you're in bear country, things like that. So also keeping it cool. Um, you know, I've stayed long enough on multiple tag hunts where I've had deer and elk tag. You, Your sleeping bag is an insulator. So people think there's like little ninjas in there creating heat. It's actually your body that creates heat, traps it inside. If you let the meat sit overnight, it cools off, gets the crust over it. You actually want to put your sleeping bag around that because now that is actually trapping cold inside, not heat. So you can use your sleeping bag to keep meat to go. I'm rambling here, but you get the idea. What do you use? This has always been kind of a quandary of mine is what do I use for a sleeping pad? I mean, I remember the trip I went on you and you talked me into a bivy sack and I don't think I slept a bit for seven days i felt like i was in a straight jacket you know so um i just i just bought a zen bivy sleep system but i always wonder what kind of pad do i do you know what does your pad weigh you know i've got the neoware i talked to you yesterday a little bit about it, but it it's leaking you know what's durable what's uh what do you sleep on because sleep's important obviously for recharging your batteries so i have five sleeping pads Again, I have the monetary ability to buy five because they're expensive. They're 150 to 200 bucks. So you look at the R value, which the R value, when you compress your sleeping bag down, um, when you sleep in it, all your insulation is gone. So the pad takes up for that. Depending upon the time of the year, you need 3.7 R value or higher in colder weather. You can go lower than that, obviously, when it's warmer. So for me, I don't like the elongated tubes as much, um, which some companies have. So uh, Big Agnes um, Q-Core SLX is my old man pad. It's like four inches thick. Uh, to Summit has an ether, I think it's called. Uh, they have a couple different models. And then the Thermarest x Light and X-Therm. Um, and But what you're going to also look at after the R value is the thickness, right? How much comfort you want as far as squishiness and then you also want to look at um you want a rectangle do you need a really long do you roll do you want a 25 inch wide a 22 inch wide do you, are you you know do you roll around so f you know for me sure. i i basically try to get a 25 inch wide pad that's 72 inches long and i want a minimum 3.7 r value anything extreme any kind of sheep or goat hunt high country mule deer um and then the the thickness Depending upon the pad, you know, you want at least a two and a half inch thick sleeping pad for the most part. Um, 
but I would say that what I listed, the Cedar of Summits are good. The Big Agnuses are decent. Uh, the Thermo Rests are great. What's the approximate weight on your sleeping pad? Anywhere from 12 to 18 ounces. So colder weather, 18 ounces. So, but 12 yeah. ounces uh, under a pound. Like right now, I'm carrying a Spartan Sea to Summit with a low R value, and uh, it weighs 13.4 ounces. Um, and uh, I also, blowing one of those things up, uh, sucks. So I actually have a little uh, air air pump that's about that big that I hit a button and it blows it up for me because I'm getting old and I 20 breaths and about pass out hiking in. So I carry that with me as well. All right. Well, cool. That's good. That's good to know. Well, let's just jump right into your your bow hunting gear and your, your optics and things like that that you carry because I, that's one thing that I remember from our hunt in Colorado is that uh, <laughs> go back to the the whole cutting gear. I remember Randy Ulmer telling me a story one time. He went on a hunt with Tony Russ up in Alaska, and I, I think it was more just arrogance than anything. But he, Tony made him lay his gear out, and the first thing he made him not carry was his Leica binoculars. He said, "I'm the guy, and I'll find the sheep." I think I'd punch that guy right in the teeth right then. But uh, <laughs> let's start with your your archery equipment. So, you know, Gold Tips and Archery Company. You know, we're both archers, uh, and what do you use? I mean, what what is your bow weight? Do you? I know I personally opt for a little bit heavier stabilizer system because I may only get one shot, and I believe that you know the moment of truth, nothing's going to help you like a little mass weight. A lot of guys get really strung out on, on really super light bows, and super light bows can be very difficult to shoot when you're huffing and puffing, when you're you know you're you're under the you know the nerves that most people get when they're, they're shooting animals. You probably don't get them anymore because you, you know, dusted a half a million animals with a bow, but. Uh, yeah, you and I parallel as much crap as we talk back and forth. I pack a heavy bow in, and when I say heavy, it's, it's heavy. I mean, it's 10 pounds. Um, 10 pounds. Oh, wow. That's just. Um, yeah. I mean, and I say that every year is a little bit different, but it's guaranteed eight and it, it can be upwards, you know, depending. So, and I go back and forth a little bit. Uh, you know, it depends on the bow as far as I have a kicker bar on there. And I'm usually about 30% up front, 70 in the back for my kicker bar. So whatever, if th three ounces on the front stabilizer, seven on the back, roughly. And that's not always exact, but a rough um, whatever scenario or, or blueprint. So for, for me, it does not do any good if you cannot hit the, the dang animal. And people Perfect. seem to forget that a lot. They're like, I want a 30 inch bow. It's more maneuverable. I want a light bow because I got to carry it. It's like, well, what can you hit? Now, if you're shooting 40 and in, a little bit different, but right. out West, those shots don't always pan out, especially on high country mule deer. So yeah. I shoot, it does not matter what that bow weighs, that, that bow weighs what it weighs when it's at most accurate. And that is what I focus on. I do not care what it weighs. I don't even put, I don't even weigh it unless people ask me. And then I carry generally um, a five arrow quiver and I carry at least six extras. So okay, that was another question I was going to have for you. I mean, nobody wants to hike. Things happen, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I was up on a caribou hunt last year in Alaska. And of course I made a bonehead mistake of cutting my arrows too short at the last minute. And I was able to rescue myself with some longer biter knocks and, <laughs> I mean, I was drawing those things like, I mean, right a sixteenth of an inch or less from my from my thorn broadheads. Well, when I got under the heat of the moment, I think I was drawing that a little bit up on the broadhead, and man, I couldn't hit nothing. So I completely had to retune my bow, and I'm glad I took as many arrows as I did with me. Now that was a float plane trip. I, I think, you know. You look at a lot of these quiver companies and they'll put five arrow quivers in. Well, I run a tight spot for my, like for my what stuff I'm packing in. I'm going to carry seven there. I don't know if I would carry more than that. Depends how far back in I'm going, I guess. So for me, and I, you make fun of me because I bounce them back and forth from a side mount quiver. And I, I do use a quivalizer every now and then. And that's an eight arrow quivalizer. Yeah. So I'm like loaded for bear with that one. But when, when I go in, I've seen people make comments about this of like, oh, if you have to bring X amount of arrows, learn how to hunt or shoot. Yeah, sure. I don't uh, can't shoot, probably. Generally, that is actually the case. And so for me, it is all the different, whether it be guiding, hunting, everything I've ever seen happen. 
if I fall off a cliff with my quiver on, and let's just say the arrows pop out, fall off a cliff, I bend them, I break them, whatever, I've got a full reload in there. The other thing too, if something happens, I want a couple field tips or a judo tip to fire at camp at a dirt, you know, dirt clod. I also really like to eat grouse. So I'll shoot a grouse if it's in season, um, you know, things like that. So, and then when you're on multiple animal hunts, which I go on frequently where I'll have a, a black bear, a uh, mule deer and an elk tag, I'm not shooting just one and coming out. I keep hunting, you know, take care of the meat, which, you know, you're losing probably an arrow, you know, you want to count on losing it anyway. So I always carry at least six extras and five on the bow. Sure. Um, and I would say, if anybody's telling you that's wrong, I would take a real hard look of what they've done on backpack hunting. Sure. That may be wrong in and out, you know, or whatever. But like when you're on a 12 day backpack, hunt, a lot of things can go wrong and it's not that much extra weight for something that can totally end your hunt. You have to have ammo. So. Yeah, you know, back on the arrows and the quiver thing, you know, you watch a lot of these Eastern guys come out and you watch them on TV. They take the quiver off and set it on the ground. And it's like, what are you doing, man? I, I remember I went through the old Chuck Adams phase. You know, I grew up in, you know, so did you. The old quiver, hip quiver yeah. right? Yeah. So I slid slid down an avalanche chute full of skunk cabbage and I had brought in tipped arrow slime everywhere. Yeah. And I just felt like every time I walked, that thing just flagged every animal that I you know was trying to sneak up on so there's but, people that are successful like that i just don't know very many hey so, you can I only say, one. you can kill there with anything anything yeah. you know so <laughs> doesn't make it doesn't make it optimal per se but uh on the subject of arrows and and stabilization and and quivers and things like that one of the things i look at when i set my hunting bow up is and i always when i'm tuning my bow I always fill my quiver full of arrows, right? Minus one, okay? Because my arrows are 450 to 480 grains. There's six of them in the quiver. That's a lot of weight, okay? That has a stabilizing effect. I do like to keep it close to the bow on my hunting bow because as you put weight further away from the bow, I've learned this shooting tournament archery. If I have a 30-inch stabilizer on my bow, for example, and I change, you know, one ounce, I'm probably not going to change anything. There's one anomaly there is if you're shooting micro diameter arrows, if you're shooting micro diameter arrows like I hunt with, everything you change affects the tune of those things. And because it, you know, the weight on that bow or the arrows in the quiver or where the weight is on the stabilizer or the quiver or the quivalizer all affect the rotational speed of the bow. Okay. When you draw a bow back, the cable guard loads up, pulls everything to the side. When you fire, everything starts to recover. So the amount of stabilizing value that you have in a bow system dictates where that string and that arrow alignment end up when everything gets loaded up. So, you know, you want to experiment with that, even like decoys. I've shot one. I made a real long shot one time on a mule deer with a heads up decoy on the front of my stabilizer, but I had taken it out and I had shot it at 120 yards with that decoy on my stabilizer. Okay, you want to you want to get used to that stuff. You want to make sure you can or you can't. You got to you know, especially as you're dealing with longer range shots. You know, I was at, just at an IBO this last weekend, and I joke with these guys that they they allow grown men to shoot max distances of 35 yards. I'm like, that just sounds asinine. If you can't hit 50 yards out west, you don't even start bow hunting, right? So, but yeah, it's it's much more of a long range game. You've got a lot more preparation involved. Um, well, and with that, so like with what you're talking about, any weight you add or take away from the bow, no matter what you say, changes something. Now, you may not be good enough to, to tell, right. but when you get into the longer range and you're emptying your arrows out, and I've always made jokes about this, and I'm poking fun back and forth of the equivalizer, whether you take it, you have a equivalizer, it will technically change more because it's protruding out past the riser than it would vertically and parallel up against the right. thing is, if if you're on a full on quiver dump, um, you probably accuracy probably wasn't paramount in your skill set, right? Like if you've emptied your entire quiver, you, yeah. you know, it may change the tune, but you probably had a little issue hitting the animal. So for me, what I suggest for people with their bow setup, um, one, like you said, exactly like what you're going to hunt with, load the, load the quiver up, get everything ready, um, you know, and then hunting scenarios, when you, you talk about mechanical, fixed blade broadheads, tunes, things like that, you're never in a perfectly flat ground situation. That tournament we just shot was really rough 
footing, leg up, leg down. People do not realize how much mountain hunting changes the tune of the bow because their basically yeah. their grip and their form and alignment changes. Right. Those are all things you really need to practice because right. we, we give clinics on this. If I grab both of you and I put you on a 37 degree slope at 76 yards and you're on flat ground, and then I put your right leg up and in front of you, and now your body positioning is contorted. What also changes is easiest way to explain it. The distance from your arrow to your bus cable is changing from flat ground uh, to, you know, your body being contorted, which changes your tune, which if you have a fixed blade broadhead on changes the impact. Those are yeah. all important things to think of. Yeah. That. And it's, uh, it's ugly. I bracketed it three ways, right? And the first way to bracket it is just your body position, shot angles, like perfect conditions, meaning my heart rate's low, but your your bow being tuned, dialed, and you practicing super slanted shots, toes downhill, uphill, knowing archery, basically. Okay, if my toes are downhill, I'm probably going to, depending, you know, you want to draw into the hillside and level up. If you don't do that, your toes are pointing downhill, you're going to drift downhill generally. And Tim's way better at that stuff than I yeah, am. You call, I, I refer to it as yeah. coiling a spring, right? So if you if you're forcing the bow into the hill to level, you just coil the spring. And when you fire, it's all going to fall downhill naturally. And myself personally, I've been making this comment because we shot a pretty hilly course this last week, is anytime I get on a side hill, I almost always favor the bubble into the hill a little bit or aim an inch or two to the left uh, into the hill. Because 100%. I don't, I watch some people, it doesn't affect them, but my personal style I know it does affect me. So I, I watch guys on TV and making these extreme shots. And a lot of times you'll watch them hit them really far back because they're down shooting down a hill or something. And that's, that's really what causes that. So keep going. And, but no, in, in practicing that is important. And, and sure. so that that's, that's like level one, level two is physical, meaning we, Kim and I just hiked up a hill. Now our heart rates risen and you know, all that, goes out the window you're you're breathing hard and bouncing all over and then three is adrenaline with the animal all three of those things are going to come into play mountain hunting you can mimic two of them the third one pretty hard to replicate that one and so what i really suggest is you know i'll see people and i'm being as polite as i can here shooting a stop sign at 50 yards and then go run up and down the hill practice high heart rate shots and it's like hold on bro Go back to level one, get your group down to a softball at 50 before you move on to level two, which is the heart rate portion of it. Right. Then go to that heart rate portion of it, work on, you know, you got your bow tuned, your money out to 80, you're good. Now go work on the physical portion. The next one now is just the crap talking portion. You can't get an animal out there. Start gambling. If you're into that, start, you know, crap talking with your friends, high stress as you possibly can get to mimic that, but you don't want it. You can't go to level three without mastering level one and two, because if you try to do that and you're hunting and your level one sucks, you never practice level two and now an animal's in front of you, that's a recipe for disaster, right? Sure. So you gotta yeah. master each one. Yeah, let me give you an angle, another angle on that. So people ask me all the time, they're like, uh, so, so what do I do to practice to get to the next level? You know, how do, how do you, how are you so consistent? And I said, I, the main thing I tell them is you have to practice at a level where your bad scores can win tournaments. So from a hunting standpoint, that's, you need to, you, it needs to be so natural to you that, you know, I shoot at 120 yards all the time at a target about the size of my computer screen here. And when I see 80 in my rangefinder, psychologically, it's like slam dunk. It's like, it's over. It's like, you miss because you think about missing. It's your own self-esteem and your own uh, self-image that's going to dictate a lot of the success and failure. And I used to, I've learned this the hard way, and I don't think there's any better way than to get your butt out into competition, okay? Because competition is going to breed better archers. The people that compete and hunt are better shooters, period. Um, it's hard to mimic that. I used to get really jangled in like FIDA OR rounds you know, which is a head-to-head -head competition. And it's just, it's kind of like a, I call it par archery, where if you miss one, you're, you're gone, yeah. or if you miss two, you're gone. So it's like a predetermined outcome. And I always have struggled with that over my archery career. 
I tend to shoot my very best when I'm behind and I don't have none of that baggage, right? Because I'm a very type A person. Type B people, they're real mellow, you know, they don't really overanalyze stuff and they tend not to have the same problems of very high strong people. You're type A? I, I didn't. <laughs> hey, a man's got a man's got to know his limitations. There's pros and cons to everything. So, you know, I, I've read everything under the, the sun on this. I mean, I believe there probably are some some ways that you can, if you're extremely disciplined, change your psychological profile, but it's difficult. You know, you got to manage, so, you know, I remember one of the Olympic guys told me one time, he said, you just got to manage breathing. Okay. You never let it get out of control. Okay. And I had got to the point where I was, I would get so jangled and I'd watch all these other guys and some of them never like manifest nerves at all. And I'm just sitting here shaking. My knees are about to buckle and it would just get worse and worse and worse because I was focusing on it. It's like target panic. People focus on it. They're afraid of it. And so they get it worse instead of focusing on what you really want to happen. So one of the things that I would tell you to do is use visualization. If you're in a hunting situation, the first thing, when you get jangled, that happens. The very first thing is, is your body wants to dump that feeling, okay? It wants to get rid of it. So you have to think, slow down, okay? Then you need to visualize, okay? And you need to visualize the shot based on the the the, the present conditions. You know, I, I, I quote David Tubbs a lot because he's a very smart individual. One of the things he said in his book that I just read was, uh, you want to visualize the shot based on the conditions. If it's blowing 20 mile an hour, don't visualize a perfectly steady shot because you're not going to have that. So you visualize the acceptable shot. Okay. So if you've got a, you've got a seven pin sight like I do, you don't just throw it up and then make your decision. You think, okay, bottom yellow pin and I co- I'll color code my pin. So I've got two yellow pins and the rest green. So I only got to remember that 60 and 90 are my yellow pins, and then I then I can go from there. And that freaks a lot of people out, but all them pins are there because I got burned at some point, right? And what's actually more accurate in a you know perfect shooting condition, like a single pin sights have gotten popular, right? Horrible from the for guys, me. from the guys that that frankly I think don't have a lot of archery experience. Yeah, it's more accurate, of course it is, but it's not practical, okay. There's practicality and then there's more accurate. And so you have to draw a happy medium in there. So, you know, you want to visualize what's going to happen. My pin's going right there. That pin's going right there. Slow, slow, slow. If you'll take the time to just slow down a little bit, okay? When I set my wife up and hunt, I'm not going to put her in a seven pin movable site. I'm going to put her in three. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I use the middle pin, I'm going to have one on the top of the back, one on the bottom, and then the one she's aiming with in the middle. So it's a more natural bracket. It's a more natural aim, but it also slows them down a little bit. When they have to go to longer shots, you know, you got a 20, 30, 40, or a 30, 40, 50. Once they get past 50, they got to slow down a little bit and dial the sight. If you're more experienced and you spend a lot of time where you can navigate pins and you can shoot quickly, you know, sure, add more pins, add more... uh, versatility into your system yeah i mean i i agree with everything tim's saying adding to that is is let's let's apply that for people uh when i run shooting drills and things like that what i'll do and this is something where tim would eat it up uh eat these up because you have scenarios and when we do these courses that i set up i will have a a bedded deer where if you if you stalk above it it's a 10 yard straight down shot and when i say straight down you're going to learn about your knock pinch and all other janky stuff that's going on with your bow. You have another scenario where you have a really technical stock and you have to go to full draw, step out and shoot. Then you have a third option for the same animal, which is a 68 yard bomb or for most people, a bomb. Okay. Well, where's your skill set at? Are you a good stalker and a horrible shot? Well, you better shoot the 10 yard shot, but your bow has got to be down. So we set all these things up, but what I'm getting at is running drills. You have Gillingham beside you. Okay, mule deer uh, on the right, and you've got five seconds. Okay, that mule deer is 67 yards. Okay, uh, you've got a turkey, and it's at 26 yards. You have all these targets out. You have five to seven seconds to assess and shoot. Well, if you got a one-pin guy, he's failing 
every time, any generally every time at farther distances. Right. So you have to set your bow up for what you're comfortable with and ingrain that in your brain for every scenario. So sure. I run five to seven pins. I set it up. Well, a lot of the shit I copied off of Tim, I set it up a lot of the way Tim does. And what I'll do is if you, well, all three of us are hunting and an elk pops up at 57 yards. All right. If I only have four five, six, whatever pins, I know right there because I've shot it so much. I put my 50 yard pin on its back or my 60 yard pin right at the base of its heart. You have to practice that for it yeah. to become second nature. And I guide a lot. And the worst thing in the world is a guy, you know, basically trying to dial his sight and then it moves and he's letting down dialing again that bow has to be an extension of your body in every situation or it will cost you animals and it, it sure. flat out like tim was talking about everything dumps you go back to your worst self under stress so when i always talk about instagram groups okay that's a perfect world those ones you selfie it up and you got okay let me stand beside you and see what happens. And I'm not saying that in an arrogant way. I have the same thing where I have people screaming, yelling, throwing it, whatever. So I am practicing for my, my worst situation to be the best possible outcome. Meaning you said it exactly. My worst day is still pretty damn good. If you, if you work at it. Yeah. That's the difference between pros and amateurs is their high highs and their low lows are depressed, you know? There's not that big up and down swing, you know, from from good to bad. So, yeah, I, I think that's awesome advice. Um, you know, it it you have to be fluent with your stuff, and that's you know, I'm getting ready for a big elk hunt this year. I and it's a steep mountain, and one of the things I would caution people too is to when you're shooting out west here and going on hunts like Aaron does and I do, uh, you need to trust your equipment. Um, one of those things that people trust way too much are range finders. Okay. Especially when you start cutting angles and I've learned this shooting competition T competition taught me what I know about range finders. And if you're going to be shooting steep and deep, you need to get out and see the error in that range finder <laughs> because they're not tied to ballistic profiles. And hopefully we'll, we'll you know the, the industry's moving in the direction of, of changing that 99 percent of the range finders are on the market um when you uh, have angle comp and that angle comp is good to about 22 degrees 20 degrees and 65 to 70 yards and anytime you start shifting past those it's almost right. like celsius and fahrenheit that they start good. gaining farther and farther apart so where we uh where I, i've got a part of, i've got an outfitting business with a buddy in in the davis mountains and we have frequent 35 to 50 degree angle shots at, at really steep angles the level of your bow comes into that we'll have to hit that on another podcast but back in the day i glued a clinometer on the side of my range finder or inclinometer whatever it's called i would range and then i would look at the angle and then I had a cut chart on my forearm. Um, then they came out with angle comp range finders, <laughs> but they're, they're flawed. You still have to cut more off of those. And so some range finders, at, even with angle comp, um, well, all of them, if it's, and I'll see, Tim, you'll, you'll be able to nail this, 46 degree angle, uh, 100 yard actual, and it would be 67 with the cut. Um, at that steep of an angle how much would that range finder be off to true uh the true actual shot compared to what the angle comp gives you just off the top of my head on a cosine range finder it would probably be off around five yards and on a rx5 it'd probably be off about two yards yeah yeah not a little bit off on that for me it's a yard and a half um but yeah. there are some yeah. range finders a yard and a half off. at one what did you say 100 yards uh, yeah, at a hundred, right? And so, yeah. Yeah, but no, I, 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 the thing is though, is that's ingrained in Tim's head. So if I'm guiding Tim, I am not worried when I say with, with an angle comp range finder and I say, all right, dude, it's 67 in his brain. He's already deducting what he knows to deduct where most people shoot, they shoot over its back and they're like, ah, it's just a bad shot. It might've been 
but it didn't help with that rangefinder. And we see a lot of missing with this. And when I yeah, say I a think, lot of missing, yeah. a lot. A lot of people trust that rangefinder. They think they just missed, and they don't even understand that that could be a problem. You know, I learned that stuff preparing for uh, European Pro Series archery, where they just those guys love just setting up courses that are brutal, kind of like what you talked about. You know, I shot my first doll sheep and my only doll sheep three days before I moved from Alaska. And I remember the, everybody telling me, you're going to get shots, but they're super steep and they're hard to, this is my first introduction to this. And it's going to be super hard to know what to set your sight on. And to this day, that is still the number one problem when you have a steep angle shot is what am I going to set my sight on? So I had got a book from Kirk Etheridge at the time and he had a cut chart in there and I just printed it off, laminated it, stuck in my pack, had a little angle meter like you were talking about. And I figured it that way. And I made a 50, what it was 46 yards at 55 degrees slope. And I had shot it with the first Bushnell rangefinder. And that thing was telling me to shoot that thing for like 23 yards. <laughs> I was like, oh, crap, that's a lot. Uh -huh. You know, that's yeah. hard to trust. So I just trusted it. And in retrospect, I probably still hit a little bit high because I'm sure that thing wasn't, you know, I'm sure that cut chart was just a cosine cut chart and it wasn't completely right. But, uh, I think you're starting to see companies. Um, I know I've had some conversations with Bushnell about getting this uh, this fixed. We did come out with a really good rangefinder in the, the broadhead for tournament use. I mean, it really, you know, ranges perfectly accurate on a steel tape on all different target medians. And, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't bounce. It doesn't give you yeah. false positives. That's a big Yeah, one. bouncing. One, that's another thing on rangefinders. When you guys are using rangefinders, you need to experiment with them. Because if they have a slow processor, okay, you need to really brace that rangefinder. It's one of the problems with the RX-5 and RX-4 is it's got a much slower processor than, say, their 2800i, okay? And therefore, if you're moving a little bit when you range an animal, it can give you a, a, a bounce around in the reading. You know, I had a set of Leica Geovids on an elk one time. If you move them stupid things, they would they would add like three yards to your, you know, to your yardage. and I actually shot an elk bad with, with them once, just, you know, dumb stuff. Everything we do, I'm sure for you, is because of what you've seen or experienced yourself. And so you just, when I get Collective ready Collective of bad experiences is what, what yeah. it boils down to. <laughs> and, and I'm still going to run that cut chart on my, on my uh, arm, but I'm going to go out and I'm going to shoot my hunting bow in at the speed and the arrows that I'm using. Um, ballistics is important with this. If you really want to make those long shots, you really got to do the homework. You know, you got it. It's very easy. You can go out and use your range finder and then come up with a percentage cut that's quick. You know, it's just on your arm guard and kind of a, it's a 1%, 2%, 3%. Well, 3% of 100 is 3. 3% of 80 is 2.4. It's very quick, right? So something that you can cut off of the range finder. And I've screwed some big animals up because uh, either I didn't use my range finder or I trusted it and, you know, it, I'm going on a spot and stock hunt in Africa this year in some mountain country. And same thing is I want to be able to make any shot that presents itself. And that, that just comes with homework. So Aaron, again, I want to thank you for, for coming on our first episode of archery ops. Um, we look forward to having this, uh, this podcast, you know, be a little different than what you and I have done in the past, but, you know, be very structured around topics and, and teach people some of the things that uh, they might not know. I want to introduce them to people, you know, that are experts in their field that they may not know and just kind of break down some of the paradigms, you know, that exist in the archery world and just make people more educated and better bow hunters and target archers. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on. I'm excited uh, about uh, this podcast because it's a it's an avenue for me to send people to for sure. for knowledge um there's there's a everybody learns differently from different people like some people may click with you better than me or vice versa mm -hmm. um and then knowledge wise knowing what you know um and you know the people that you can get on it's it's exciting for me um, I think I've actually hounded you before about starting a podcast or maybe giving you crap about it. Um, just that much knowledge can be so beneficial for for people. And again, it's a place for me to send people, which is great. Like, hey, don't listen to me. Go listen to these guys. And I'm excited. I, I, I'm looking forward well, to it. Well, it's the same thing. You know, we want to, you know, I want to be able to send people to guys like you when they have backpacking questions, when they 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 want a backpack, when they, 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 they want to know what kind of gear to get. Uh, you know, 
there's experts in every field and everybody can't be an expert at everything. So I appreciate you coming on and, uh, you know, we look forward to maybe even having you on in, the, in you know, in the future on a, on a different topic. So um, good luck on your hunts this fall and I guess your fishing trip tomorrow. Today, yeah, if we today, if we make it there. So, yeah, good. Well, good luck to you as well. And, and thanks for having me on. It's been great. Hey, before you go, there's a great way to get even more info and tips. Follow this podcast and check out Gold Tip on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Thanks for listening. And as always, start tough and stay true.